All right. Well, uh, this today's message is a uh, long time coming. Um, in 2019, anybody or 2020, anybody remember what happened in 2020 March? COVID, COVID happened. Yeah, yeah. Um, Amanda and I had planned out, I think, the first six months of the year uh, with uh, teaching series and and uh, our serves and all of that. And one of the things we were going to do early on in 2020 was uh, we recognized that there were several people in the church at that time who had not been baptized. Uh, who had not taken that step forward, but had given their life to Jesus. And uh, we wanted to create that opportunity and help them move forward in that in that profession of faith. So, you know, 2020 came and we got sucked into COVID and we were out of the school and we were on the patio and then we were in the park and things were just so distracting. Um, I woke up this recently and I thought, gosh, we never did baptisms back in 2020. And here we are almost four years later and we still had not done that so i want to take this time this week to talk about baptism and then give the opportunity in the coming weeks i'll find a suitable place um, we can select probably one of four churches that we could do it at or uh, there are other options my sis we were going to try and do it next weekend with my sister but porsche is going to be out of town at winter camp so we'll be doing it some other time it looks like it might rain next weekend too so they might even get rained out i'm not i'm not certain of what they're doing there but i want to talk about baptism and what it is today i want to talk about what it is uh why christians do this thing that might seem silly to outsiders going down in the water it's like anybody ever taken a bath before of course we've taken a bath it's not just cleaning me off obviously so we're going to talk about baptism and why we do that. So what about baptism? Well, from the outside uh, looking in, people who are outside looking in might seem that it's kind of foolish, right? You get up on a stage or in a room or in a backyard or at the ocean and somebody dunks you under the water and you come up and uh, they would look at you. Maybe some of them would judge you and say, went in a wet center, came out or went in a dry center, came out a wet center. Um, and some of the reality of that is true. Yes, we are sinners, but we find ourselves in God's grace with his blood covering our sin. And that's not what baptism is. The people uh, getting into a body of water and being dunked, it seems like a foolish act to people on the outside. But from the inside, we know that the action doesn't do anything to us necessarily, right? Like going into the water is not special. I mean, the ocean is the ocean. You've swam in it before. Um, you've been in a pool. You've been in a bathtub. The water comes from the local municipality. It's not special. It's not shipped in from uh, somewhere special like the Holy Land. If you get baptized and you're expecting your life to change because you got in the water, that is not necessarily true. It's just not. You'll go down with dry hair and you'll come up with wet hair. Uh, and people will likely clap and celebrate with you. But if the work has not happened on the inside, the outside isn't going to do the work that needs to happen on the inside. So what is baptism? Well, it's a Christian observance symbolizing transformation of the heart, of our hearts, and the surrender to follow Jesus. It is our expression of saying, I have decided to follow Jesus. I'd like to read uh, I'd like to read the passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 3. Many of you have probably read this before. Some of you may not have, or some of you guys that are watching online may not have. So we find ourselves in Matthew 3. We're going to read the whole chapter, and it's a story of Jesus being baptized. Because if we're going to follow Jesus, we should do the things that Jesus did. And in this passage of scripture in Matthew chapter 3, we're going to see that Jesus did the exact same thing that we are taking that step in. It says in Matthew chapter 3, verse 1, In those days John the Baptist came, preaching in the wilderness of Judea, saying, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. This is he who was spoken of through the prophet Isaiah, a voice of one calling in the wilderness, Prepare the way for the Lord, make straight the paths for him. John's clothes were made of camel hair, and he had a leather belt around his waist, his food was locusts and wild honey. Sounds yummy, huh? I was watching that show alone yesterday. Um, 
I took a rest day yesterday and I was watching that show alone and these people were eating very disgusting things like seaweed and anything that was that looked apparently edible and I think that's what John the Baptist was doing out there in the wilderness with his time with God he was eating locusts and wild honey it says this people went out to him from Jerusalem and all Judea and the whole region of the Jordan confessing their sins they were baptized by him in the Jordan River but when he saw many of the Pharisees and the Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, this is it's pretty brutal too. <laughs> That's why they didn't like him. He said to them, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the coming wrath? Produce fruit in keeping with repentance. And do not think you can say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father and tell you that out of these stones God can rise up children from Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown on the fire. He goes on to say, I baptize you with water for repentance, but after me comes one who is more powerful than I. Those whose sandals I am not worthy to carry, he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. John was saying, there are Jews in the land and they're coming out to me and they're saying, you know, we, we want this new baptism, this baptism of repentance. And they were coming to him and he was baptizing, but he was saying, there's someone greater than I who's going to baptize in other ways in the Holy Spirit, which I'm sure they didn't understand at that point, what he was alluding to, but he already knew that Jesus was going to be coming and would begin baptizing people in the Holy Spirit and fire. His winnowing fork, that he goes on in some eloquent language, his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor. A winnowing fork is, uh, is what they would do is they would lift up the wheat and when they were separating it from the chaff, they would throw it in the air and the wind would take the chaff and blow it away and only the wheat would fall to the ground. And he's talking about Jesus, how his winnowing fork is going to separate us. Those who would say, Lord, Lord, we follow you. And those who would just, uh, who actually were following Jesus Christ. It says this, so his winnowing fork is in his hand and he will clear his threshing floor, gathering his wheat into the barn and burning up the chaff with unquenchable fire. Then Jesus came from Galilee to Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him saying, I need to be baptized by you. And do you come and do you come to me? Jesus replied, "Let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this to fulfill the right, all righteousness." Then Jesus consent then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptized, he came up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened and he saw a spirit, the spirit of God, descending like a dove and alighting him on him. And the voice from heaven said this, this is my son whom I love. With him, I am well pleased. So there's something special that happens in baptism when your heart is aligned. John was calling out the Sadducees and the Pharisees and saying, why are you coming out here? We know how you treat people. We know how you use the law. We know how you do these things. Your heart is far from God. He called them brood, a brood of vipers. Um, that's, that's not very... Uh, it's not a very appealing to that group of people. They were not excited to be called in front of all the people, a brood of vipers. And yet when Jesus came, the pure one, uh, he said, I'm not worthy to be baptizing you. You should be baptizing me. So if going into the water doesn't do anything to us, if the water is not special, then why do we do it? Well, we'll get into this in the end of the message, but I want to begin to introduce a few ideas here and talk about baptism in a little deeper way. Why would you and I do this? Why did I do this as a, I believe, 13 year old? Why did I do this? Why do other believers do this? Why do, why have millions and millions of people, why have billions of people followed Jesus in water baptism? In Mark chapter one, verse 22, it says, the people were amazed at Jesus' teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. You might go, Jeremy, why are you reading this scripture? It doesn't seem to make sense in this context, but we recognize God's authority, just like Jesus. Jesus had the authority and we recognize God's authority. And the first reason we would follow Jesus in water baptism is that we understand the authority of God as that God's authority has all over our lives and we want to submit our ways to God's ways. 
Like Jesus Christ and the Father God has authority over our lives, whether we recognize it or not. If God does not want you to live tomorrow, you will perish today. That's the kind of authority that God has. So that you are still breathing in this day and time means that God wants you living and moving and running around on this earth, spreading his word through the light. He wants to continue relationship with you. It is his authority that we follow because Jesus in water baptism did it. So because we see his authority, we want to follow in that authority. Just like the laws of the land, we submit to God's ways. And this is one of God's ways. He said, do this also. Matthew 4, chapter 18, or Matthew, Matthew chapter 4, verse 18 through 20 says this. Jesus calls his first disciples. As Jesus was walking beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon, called Peter, and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were, they were fishermen. Jesus said, come, follow me, and I will send you out to fish for people. At once they left their nets and they followed him. So Jesus is, has all authority. Jesus surrenders to God's authority and is baptized, and then he asks us to follow him. Well, what did Jesus do? Well, one of the first things he did in his ministry was to be baptized. So part of that process of following him and identifying with him, many of you guys might think, how do I follow somebody? Well, you guys all have run around. Raise your hand if you've run around with a crew of people in your life. Like maybe you're a teenager. When you hang around with kids, uh, teenagers, and you start to be in their crew, you start to dress like them oftentimes. And you often use the la same language that they use. And you might listen to the same artists that they listen to and like the same things and go on the same trips. When you start to follow and be around people, you start to be like them and you identify like them. And what, we're, what God is calling us into is this deep relationship into following Jesus Christ fought like he followed the will of the Father. He said, follow me. And to us, this may seem an innocuous statement, but this is a radical statement at that time when he said to follow me. Because, I mean, Jesus had stepped into a Jewish world. He was a Jew. He stepped into a Jewish world. He stepped into a history and tradition and culture of thousands of years of Judaism. Like they had worshiped in the same ways for so long. He stepped into this Jewish world with Jewish people as a Jew. And then he said something very bold. He said, follow me. And, and I'm sure that's confusing to people because they're like, well, we're supposed to follow God. Why would we follow you, guy who comes from a little town and we're starting to maybe hear rumblings of? It's not like he was all over social media and everybody knew of all the miracles that he'd done. But you know, rumors had begun, had, had, were starting to get out, right? So he is asking them to call him, to follow him. Jesus stepped into that Jewish world and said something very bold, follow me. And likewise, in this world, in our day and age, Jesus steps into our reality. And we have a history and tradition and culture. And in our culture, American culture is not to be baptized. That is something that is Christian. It's uniquely Christian. It's following in the ways of Jesus Christ. Likewise, Jesus steps into our world and says to us, to you and to me, he says, follow me. He says, follow me. And this is bold because I don't know about you guys, but it's hard to reject the world, is it not? The things of the world, the desires of the flesh, the things that we want to do. It's hard to reject the world. And yet Christ followers are different. Christ followers are different with their time. What do people, what do Christians do with their time? Well, Christians, people who follow Jesus should be doing things like Jesus does. They should be going to the outsider. They should be spending their time showing love and care and blessing other people. That's how our time should be spent. Jesus says, follow me. He says, follow me with your talents. Now, there are ways to use our talents for our own personal gain, our own unique gain, right? It's like, hey, I can use in my voice, in my mind, in my hands to be creative, and I can use it all for me. But the scriptures tell us that everything that comes to me through my talent that God gave me is not for me. It's for him. It's for him alone. And he will bless us. So we surrender our time and we surrender our talent 
And then we also surrender our treasure. All that God gives to us, it's not for us. Christians are generous people, not stingy, greedy people. Christians are people who should be loving others and giving away food and giving away their time and giving away their possessions. We should be giving away what we value. Christians live for the kingdom. Christians live for the kingdom and it's greater than worldly pleasure. When you put your hand and your life in the hands of God, the things that you begin to understand and see, the blessings, even in this show, yesterday I'm watching the show alone and this guy's out there with nothing, eating, you know, dirt and sticks and whatever else he can rummage up, uh, you know, gross mushrooms and, and, and it just, it's just gross. Like he's living in this way and he's just so grateful for the life. He's going on and on about how grateful he is for the life that he has, for his family and for his mother and the way that he was raised and, and all those things. And this gratitude just wells up in him because he was connected to something greater than him. He was showing gratitude and thanksgiving. But to follow Jesus looks like surrender. How many like to surrender? How many ever play mercy? Like you get your hands and you know, you got to do it. And then somebody is stronger than you and they have more willpower than you. And you just got to say mercy because they beat you at the game. It's, it can be that way with God sometimes. Anybody ever wrestled with God? Uh, in the Bible, there was some wrestling with God. I've wrestled with God many times. God, why this? Why not this avenue? Why did you make me this way? Why did you, why did you give me these skills? Why did you give me this opportunity? But following Jesus means to first, it means first and foremost to surrender. Jesus said, follow me. This follow me request, it's a process. He, he called his disciples like we just read. He called them and he said this. He said, come and see. He said, come and see. But the journey with Jesus, if you follow any of his disciples, all of the journey for all of his disciples was come and see to what? Come and die. Come and die. Come and give your life for the cause of the gospel, for other people, for my kingdom. Surrender to me. You might be thinking, like, come and die. Like, I don't, I don't want to die. I don't want to die. And Jesus clearly wants you alive right now. You're still alive. He doesn't want you to physically die in this way. It is a spiritual death. It's a death to yourself. It's a death to the world. It's the death to all the desires, the, the, the fleshly desires of your life. That's what baptism is. It is symbolism of your very own funeral to who you are and who God is. Because the going under the water is significant because you are going into the water, which symbolizes going into the ground, but being raised up as a new creature. The old ways are gone and the new ways have come. It's a symbolism of death and rebirth. And I don't know about you, I hope some of you would like to be rebirthed into the kingdom of God and are recognizing God is already doing that work in my heart. I've already come to see and I'm wrestling with the coming and dying part. And that's a journey. It, it happens through the course of our whole life. There are new ways to die to our flesh. Each and every year, there's something new. Another big, right when you think, oh man, I got this whole thing figured out, God's like, no, you don't. <laughs> don't, don't kid yourself. There's deeper and deeper ways to live for Jesus. It's not a physical death that we're calling you into, that God is calling you into, but a death to that flesh. Really what it is, it's a realignment, an alignment of your life, not with your ways, but with the ways of Jesus. So the question is, who should be baptized? What, what needs to happen? Who should get baptized? Because like I said a moment ago, if you go in a center and you're dry center, you just come up a wet center. So some, clearly something has to happen well, two things at least, two things need to happen. We need to have an encounter with Jesus. We need to have an encounter with Jesus. If you haven't had an encounter with Jesus, if you don't feel as though Jesus is calling you and saying there's a different way for you, for you to live your name, insert your name here. If you don't feel as though God is leading you into this, then it might not be the right time. Because you should sense a drawing, a tugging, um, you should sense uh, maybe the ways that your friends are going or the world is going. Oh, that, 
I mean, it looks enticing, but that's not for me. I can tell the, the Spirit of God is doing something, something deep in my heart. We need to have an encounter with Jesus. And that can look many different ways. It's, a, it's just, in general, a drawing towards God. Maybe that you're here. Maybe that you're listening. Maybe that you're wanting to read your Bible more. Maybe that you're wanting uh, to know more about God and what his purposes are for you. That is definitely a drawing of the Spirit of God. It's evidence that God is already doing work in your life, and you're on that journey. Maybe secondly, a, a, a repentance from a life that you were living. That's another evidence. Like, you know what? I, I lived that life. We've heard that story multiple times throughout the years of this church existing. People saying, you know what? I lived that life, and I have decided that I'm going to follow Jesus from now on. Because it's better. It's better. The second thing is we need to recognize that that God has authority over our lives and, and that we're ready to begin that process or continue that process of surrendering our will to his. In Luke chapter 22, it says this, Jesus says, not my will, but yours be done. Not my will, but yours be done. And that should be our proclamation to God the Father, to Jesus. God, not my will, but yours be done. If you, if you call me into it, I may not want to say yes. I may not, I, 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 I definitely don't want to say yes. And that's okay. I just had a conversation with somebody this week who I've been talking with. And, and he said, you know, he said, Jeremy, I'm, it's the hardest thing to say. He said, but, you know, I've, I've not been the spiritual leader of my home. I've kind of let my wife do that. And, he said, but, you know, I've been taking these steps with God and I've been leading more. And the more that I lead, the more God is calling me into. And and he said, man, I, I just can't shake this feeling that God is wanting me to lead people and like maybe plant a church or pastor or something like that. And, and, and that's a revelation of God, the spirit of God working, transforming somebody's life. Not my will, but yours be done. It wasn't his desire. It wasn't my desire, but it is a surrender to God's authority. So those two things should be happening in your life. You'd have an encounter with Jesus and a recognition that God's authority is ruling over your life and you're wanting to walk that path and go on that journey with him. I'll tell you my story very quickly. I grew up in a Christian home and I think I was baptized at, I think I was 13. What I remember is the water was cold because the baptismal tank heater was broken and it was the middle of October so only cold water from the tap went into the life center baptismal tank so it was freezing I was happy to get out of there I wasn't so happy to get in there I was baptized at 13 um, and in, in many ways I think my my journey is a lot like other Christians who have maybe as we get older and mature we see and understand the movement of God in our lives um, I kind of existed in church and, and you know, did some good things and I existed till I was about 20 years old when I really felt um, a drawing of God in a different direction. And for me, it was a, a bit of a spiritual crisis. I thought the church, most of the time, the institution of the church, a church I belong to in many ways, many people were happy to be part of somewhat of like a country club. And there wasn't a whole lot of people that were going out in the world. And, and there was this sign over the door and it said, you're now entering the mission field. And I felt like most people that left those doors didn't treat the world outside like it was a mission field. And it hurt me. It hurt my heart because... I believe that if we do believe that God's authority is over our lives, we should be surrendering more and more and becoming more and more like him. And if we are that light, then people should be attracted to us. There should be evidence uh, that we're living a life for Jesus. So that's kind of where I found myself. In many ways, I thought the church that I was growing up a part of was creating um, a, a bunch of Pharisees, people who knew the Bible, but didn't necessarily live out the Bible. And that was something that I wanted to change in my own life. Matthew 15, eight and nine says this, these people honor me with their lips, but their hearts are far from me. They worship me in vain. Their teachings are merely human rules. And I wouldn't condemn, there are a lot of great people who uh, love Jesus that were part of the church and I love them dearly. Uh, many of them, some of them will go to our camp this year and uh, 
and they love Jesus and they love living their lives that way. Uh, but I think, I think institutions, churches can get caught up in a rhythm that is not missional and it can be about uh, the people who are already inside when we're called to go. So a lot of Christians in a lot of churches have had this same encounter with Jesus Christ like I had and they surrendered their lives to Jesus Christ. But some people want to have their cake and eat it too. They kind of just want to put like a Jesus jacket on. Like they want fire insurance so they don't go to hell, but aren't really interested in surrendering their life uh, and their giving of their time, their talent, and their treasure to build the kingdom of God, to have hard conversations with people, to uh, be alongside people when they're going through spiritual or physical or emotional crisis. And I believe that's exactly what Jesus would be doing. So you guys know uh, the bunch of the rest of my story. Um, ended up pastoring in Arkansas and then coming out here and planting Activate Church and just trying to do things a bit differently and seeing God move in people's hearts and people's lives who were far from God, finding Jesus. I, I love that aspect. But um, some of the things that I... I want to talk about this hard in following Jesus Christ and why some people don't do it. Many people want the benefits of the Christian life, but they don't want to identify with the work of Christianity. The, it is work. Raise your hand if it's work to be a Christian. Like it, you got to wrestle with God, right? There are days when you're going, oh, this Jesus thing is hard. Carrying that cross, if you've ever watched The Passion of the Christ, you know, watching Jesus carry that cross and fall down, sometimes our journey feels that way too like i'm not doing this very well and i don't know that i want to carry this thing anymore i'd be better off without it which is not true but you feel that way sometimes many people want the benefit of being a christian but don't want to identify with that work because it's hard it's hard work how hard is it to tame your tongue anybody have trouble with that one yeah that's that's christian work people in the world don't care about that they just let it rip let it fly. Some of us know that, right? Living in the world. Just, oh yeah, you think so? I got a few choice words for you too. But that's not how a Christian should live. We're called to bless people with our tongue. It's work to deny yourself and to take up your cross, isn't it? It's work. That's not easy to do. Deny yourself. How many of you just get up in the morning and go, you know what? I just want to I just want to deny the heck out of myself this morning. I don't want to do nothing for me. Everything I do today is for everyone else. Like, no, you got three kids that are whining at you and I need this and I need that or four kids or no kids or a neighbor or parents. It's like, no, I just want some. How many have ever said this? I just need some. You said it. Me time. I just need some me time. That's not. Guys, that's not the Christian way of. I'm not saying you can't get some me time here and there. Even Jesus got away. But the reality is if a little bit of me time turns into more and more and a lot more me time, and I just think I need me time all the time because I like me. I like me a lot, especially when other people aren't around. That's not Christian. It's work to deny yourself and take up your cross. I mean, just being humble comes naturally. I don't mean the, the humble brag, like, Oh, yeah, I know. you're such a great artist. Oh, I don't know. Inside you're going, of course I'm a great artist. Look at that. It's beautiful, right? Of course. I could joke with Carmela here. Like, that's the kind of relationship Carmela and I have. Like, you know, but it's hard being humble, is it not? Yeah, we want to brag about our stuff. We want to have pride in our work. And yet the scripture teaches us to be humble. It's work to be a servant instead of being served, right? Yeah, who wants to get up, you know, when there's a bunch of people around just chatting? And who wants to get up and be that one who begins taking all the plates to the kitchen and washing the dishes and cleaning off the, the you know, the tables to prepare it for... No, there's, there's like one or two people that are hopping up to do that, but 30 other people are just happy to be served, right? Who are we to be? as Christians. We're supposed to be the first ones to hop up and serve. It's difficult to deny our desires financially, physically, emotionally. The follow me part of Jesus, that's the hard part. And yet, 
it's so fulfilling when you live this life. It's worth it. The journey is worth surrendering to the authority of God and having an encounter with Jesus Christ. The reason that we get baptized, and here it is, the reason we get baptized is to symbolize publicly that we're acknowledging that Jesus Christ has done a work in our life. He's called us his own. He's called us into his kingdom. And we are saying, yes, I will be part of that kingdom. I will learn to deny myself. I will learn to tame my tongue. I will learn to be a servant. I will learn to be generous. I will follow you, Jesus, in this journey to the cross. What is the cross? Well, it was just a surrender of our lives for the benefit of others. That was what Jesus did, if you boil it down, right? He died on the cross to benefit all of humanity. And we're being called to our own cross to surrender our lives, to deny ourselves for the benefit of humanity. Will we do that? If the answer is yes, if you've made that decision, then should you be baptized? The answer is yes. Who shouldn't be baptized? Well, anybody who doesn't feel drawn to Jesus Christ. If you have, if, if I say Jesus, and you're like, eh, take it or leave it. You shouldn't get baptized. It's not going to do anything for you. It is not going to change you. If you don't want to surrender more of your life, well, if you don't want to, there's a don't want to, and there's a don't want to, and I know I'll end up doing it, right? Like anybody ever do that one? Like, you know, Janie, the other day, she, after I put all the stuff up, all the you know, snow gear and Christmas stuff up and buried it all up in the garage attic. Janie's like, I need my snow boots. Do you know where they're at? And I'm not going to let her get up on a six foot ladder and climb up into the attic of this garage. So I kind of held back and I, I didn't want to get up because I was comfortable, but I knew I was going to get up and I was going to go and help her. So if you feel that this being drawn to Jesus but you don't want to surrender, but you know, I'm going to surrender. It's just a little bit of a battle. Then, you know, you should probably get baptized. But if you're in this and you're like, my feet are dug in, I'm never surrendering to God. God can go and take it and take his ball and go away. That's fine. You probably shouldn't get baptized. If you're just doing it because of friends and family, if you think, oh, I'm going to, you know, make my mom or my dad or my, you know, somebody proud. If that's the reason you're doing it, you shouldn't do it. You shouldn't do it. It's not worth it. There's no reason to do it because just to satisfy your friends and family or, you know, get some sort of party or something like that, get taken to lunch. And if you feel forced into doing it, you should not be participating in baptism. The Holy Spirit is a gentleman. The Holy Spirit will draw you into his presence and there will be a time, hopefully, when you will want to say yes and say, I have decided to follow Jesus. Baptism is an amazing Christian observance open to all who hear the call of Jesus Christ from come and see to come and die to surrender their lives and say, you know what? The world behind me and Christ before me and I'm following Jesus. Any of us who would say, here I am, send me Jesus. Send me into this world, transform my life. If that's you, if you're experiencing that on a, on a level and you say, you know what, this is, I can recognize that Jesus has done something in my heart. I can recognize I'm on this journey with Jesus already. Then you should get baptized. And we're going to give opportunity to that in the coming weeks. Um, I would want for you to reach out to me and, and maybe pray about it and reach out and say, yeah, I think I want to do that. Um, some of you may have been, some of you watching online uh, may want to be baptized and you may have been baptized as a child. Um, in years past, there are people who have felt like some of the reasons they got baptized were just to make their family happy and it didn't mean anything for them. And if it would be meaningful for you, if you're watching online or if you're here and you say, you know what, I've chosen now and I believe I'm following Jesus Christ and, and you want to partake in water baptism, we would be happy to uh, baptize you. It would be a phenomenal experience for us to experience with you in being able to say with you, we agree as the church, as God's church, we agree that God has done something in your life and you have been placed into his hand and something special 
is has budded and is growing in your life. So that is what baptism is, being baptized into the kingdom of Jesus Christ and the journey and the adventure that awaits uh, when you surrender your life to Jesus. It's a beautiful thing. I can say that from experience um, over the years. He's always been faithful, uh, even in my coming and my going and my stubbornness and my own desires getting in the way sometimes God has always been faithful at um, grabbing my heart and refocusing me and reminding me that I am his and he is mine so if you want to be baptized uh, we'll have a conversation a way for you guys to uh, let me know over the coming weeks and then I'm going to solidify where and when we're going to do it uh, I know some of us have missed so I will send out a text message this week with this message uh, so they can watch it and possibly participate so we can do as many as possibly possible for those who uh, are part of our family who were not here today. I know some of us are not here today. Some are with family. So um, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we are grateful for your spirit that is so loving and kind and forceful when need be and gentle in leading our hearts forward towards you. God, we recognize that in our lives, there are stubborn areas in our personality and things that we do not want to surrender to you. God, we pray. I pray with humility that you would break those things off of us because you do know the best way for our lives. You know the path of the most joy and the most <clears throat> impact on this world because you see our lives not in the moment that we are in today, but you see our lives played out and you know every possible encounter that we might have and you're leading us toward that. So Father, we thank you for what you're doing in each and every heart here from the youngest to the oldest. We thank you for the surrender that we have experienced. We acknowledge your authority and your presence in our lives and we ask that you would continue to mold us and shape us as the loving, all-knowing potter that you are shape us into the vessels of honor that you designed and created us to be we ask these things in your name amen